from the Oak Wall Studios in Las Vegas, Nevada. Hello, this is Jesse Oakley III, and welcome to the Oak Zone, where we provide positive wisdom for you, the happy people. Now, Monday through Fridays, I do my episodes of the Oak Zone, but today is Sunday morning, and it is time for the Sunday morning chat series, where I get a chance to interview a plethora of positive people that are making a big difference within their community. Whether they are professional speakers, authors, yoga instructors, teachers, anybody that's making a big difference in their community, you will hear from them sharing their words of wisdom and how they got started. Today, we have ourselves a darn good episode. I tell you what, one of my biggest dreams and biggest visions is becoming a professional speaker. I have an opportunity to actually interview this wonderful professional speaker, but for professional speakers that are out there, you have to know your topic, you have to know your audience, you have to be on certain time periods here and there, and you gotta find that different way of inspiring and motivating all the people that are out there that you are there to speak in front of. So I am here with you with one of the greats when it comes to professional speaking, Mr. Paul Artali. Paul, how's it going? Great. How are you doing, Jesse? Glad to be here. I'm doing very well. I'm very, very good. <laughs> now, without any further delay, let's chat. Sure. All right. First question I have for you is, how did you get started in your professional speaking career? Great question. Well, to, to answer that, you got to know a little bit about my story, right? So I, I was born with what some would call a, a physical disability, um, right? So I'm missing fingers on both my left and right hand. So, you know, like my left hand here is like a Ninja Turtle. This one's like the Lego man hand. And uh, so that's how I was born. And I had this dream of wanting to play college football. And it, in high school, I went for the team and made it my junior year, cut in my senior year. I think my career is over. And then through a, a six year journey, end up pay, playing a little bit of semi pro and then walking on to play and end up playing defensive end at the University of Toronto. And so that was like the background story. And as all this is going on, I kind of, I liked speaking and thought about doing it, but didn't really know what I would speak on per se. And it was funny. So before I was married, I used to wear a big football alumni ring on my, on my, my hand. And so I'd be in bars and different places and people asked me what it was. And I would tell them, and I would tell them the story and people were getting inspired by that. So that's when the, 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 the wheel started turning into my head about becoming a speaker or to being a, a serious speaker. And, and so then that started me just, you know, speaking to some small groups and I still wasn't doing it a lot. And then one day I just talked about it so much. My wife pretty much just called me out and she said, listen, either do it or stop talking about it, but stop dreaming about being a speaker and go out and become a speaker and put all your effort into it. And, that, and that's what I did. And it's changed my life. I mean, it's been for me, I've been speaking for probably about 15 years, but the last 10 years have been like serious, more serious. And they get, you know, progressive. I so feel like the first five years of me just trying to figure it out. Next five years where my wife called me out, me trying to learn about it. And then these past five years and this, this sort of five year span has been about like really going hard and fast in the speaking business. So that, that's how I kind of got into it and why I just, I love not just sharing my story with people, but actually helping people identify their challenges and break through them so that they can live their best lives and live lives on their own terms. Man, that's fascinating. Definitely a fascinating story on how you got started. The next question for you is when it comes to professional speaking, who were your major influences? Good question. So my influences are different than, than, than folks. I mean, I could say like Tony Robbins and some of those, you know, Les Brown, but I mean, most, most of my influences were in terms of my speaking style and what I latched onto early on was energy. And so my influences were like professional wrestlers and preachers and comedians, right? I mean, so when I was trying to develop who I was as a speaker, this is before I even called myself a speaker, just giving a presentation in a class or just learning who I was. And in high school, I did a lot of theater too. So, I, you know, I, I grew up, you know, in the 80s and 90s in my youth. So I, you know, I would look at wrestlers like Roddy Roddy Piper or even like Hulk Hogan, like yeah, you're, you're fist bumping, like, right? Like they had this energy to them 
that was just incredible. And so I was able to kind of like challenge channel that energy when I speak a little bit. And I had a lot of uh, theater instructors say like, man, you've got a, you've got an energy, you bring an energy to the stage that a lot of people don't. So I, I locked onto it. And then later on, it was like the rock. And so the, this energy, and so I'd watch how they would sometimes work a big room. And then preachers, I used to like, wake up on Sunday and watch a lot of preachers and I would watch like a Jimmy Swagger and just watch how they told stories and and was really really infatuated with how all different types of preachers all different denominations you know just told stories differently and and got messages across and so that was that was a big influence and then comedians I mean you know I I, I grew up I mean I could just list so many but like the Eddie Murphys and and um my early influences were, were Eddie Murphy and um a little bit of George Carlin and, and some of those guys. Eddie was big for me though. Um, and just, uh, it, just how, again, how they work. I used to watch how they worked an audience, right? How they, how they, uh, they paused and, and I watched them not even to be funny. Cause I didn't know how to be funny. I would just watch them and just be like, how do they work? Chris Rock is another one. Like, who am I missing? Like, Rock was like awesome. And just watching Rock, like, even though Chris Rock paces the stage like a tiger in his youth, especially, man, he just, he knew how to deliver a message and get to a point, sort of cut to the heart of an issue. And I always admired that. So when I blended all those three together, I kind of just subconsciously developed my own speaking style. And then, you know, as the years have gone on, I've, I've, I've learned from those that are actual speakers like Eric Thomas is an, is a, is a big influence of mine. I've, I've had the, the honor of knowing him a little bit and stuff like that. So there, there's definitely some folk in the speaking business, but yeah, wrestlers, comedians, and preachers. That was my foundation. i tell you what, if I can describe it in one word, it would be woo. Woo. Exactly. Right. I mean, you know, exactly. Yeah, that, that's it. We're, we're going to stay there. Otherwise this will turn into a wrestling podcast. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Next question is, what were the challenges you faced in getting your career started? So many. <laughs> there's so many. <laughs> Woo to that. Um, there's a few challenges, I think. So I'm going to speak to from the perspective of someone that's like trying to figure it out, right? Like you want to speak and you have absolutely no idea what you're doing, like how to do it, right? You you see someone, just be honest, most of the speakers we come into are probably – are the ones we're trying to emulate are the ones that are making a lot of money and are super popular. They have an audience and they're just on a different level in terms of, you know, how they are. Like Tony Robbins doesn't have to worry about a speaking engagement ever again. Gary Vee doesn't have to worry about a speaking engagement. So we were looking at these folks, you know, that was the hardest part is like, well, how do I start? So I think for me, um, there were a couple things I learned um, the hard way that I would ask folks that not to make as they're speaking. I think number one was really thinking about uh, when I when I work and coach speakers, I always tell them to leverage leverage your world, right? Like leverage what you know and who you know. It doesn't matter what your topic is, right? But in a lot of cases, you your topic is probably related to some aspect of who you are or even where you've been. So I'm an education guy. Like I was a K-12 teacher, then I spent 15 years working in, in college administration. I would be like the student government, I would train like the student government and the student fraternities. Like I would do leadership development with them, right? And so early on in my career, I was trying to get like Bank of America and Ford and Google as a client. And, you know, not that I couldn't have landed them, but it was it was harder to penetrate the corporate market because I was an education guy. But when I started speaking in educational associations, because I knew that world and sometimes I had contacts in that world. And because when I was on stage, I could use examples that leverage that world. It became easier. And then from there, I built my base, right? I know we've got Toastmasters that listen to this. Uh, I practiced a lot. Every major keynote or workshop I've ever done professionally, I have basically workshopped at a Toastmasters club meeting and then a Toastmasters district conference. So if I was not competing in the contest, I made it my goal every year, still is, I've been in Toastmasters for 10 years now. I will always be speaking at a district, district conference in some form. Before I got to the point where they're bringing me in to be the keynote, I would do the breakout sessions. They were always looking for quality, different breakout sessions. So if I needed to do something on work-life balance, I would say it's work-life balance for Toastmasters. If I did something on the diversity and inclusion realm, because I talk about disability, I would do it with a Toastmasters frame, right? And so um, finding those venues to practice um, allowed me to sort of get more experience. And I think the last struggle I had, um, 
Oh, sorry. Let me go back to that. Get more experience, but also leverage, right? Because Toastmasters knew me. Toastmasters trusted me, just like educators knew me. Educators then trusted me. Just like now, as I finished my PhD research, uh, it's a lot of HR stuff. HR groups know me. HR groups trust me, right? They were the ones that launched me into these other arenas. Between those three groups, that's how I got into Google and Ford and, and these different groups, right? It was through people seeing me and understanding and resonating with who I am and then recommended me. Recommenders are your best sales tools, right? Like people that like you. 100%, right? I mean, you will get cold sales, you do all that stuff, but like recommenders are where it's at. Um, and so those are the three big things. Leverage who you know, what you know. And I think the last part I would say, and this is important for emerging speakers is, especially early on, I get it. You probably have, you might not have any budget. You might not have a lot of expendable income. Um, you got to work on a website that's functional, of course. But here, here, here's the deal is pick the two or three things you just absolutely hate to do and hire someone to do it. And if you can't afford to hire someone to do it, make a plan really quick to take part of your income and, and divert it there, right? Like you make a hundred bucks speaking, 50 is going to go to web design. Like just do something because you're never going to do it well. Even though it's your business, you're never going to do it well if you don't like doing it or if you're not good at it. Trust me. And my, my website's in a... It, it, a complete redesign hopefully by the time this airs it's actually the new site's up that's how close i am to launching it um and it's going to be way better because i hired someone to do it right like graphic design flyers all that stuff hire someone to do it um so that you don't have to do it and you can spend more time developing your speech and selling yourself um as as a business because we, we try to take on too much out of the gate and it takes away from what we really need to do that is beyond fascinating now the next question i have for you is what were some of your best moments, your good points within your speaking career? Good points within my speaking career. That's a fantastic question. I, I think there's a few. Uh, I've got a few. I, I'll say a couple. I think there are the, uh, there's the aha moments, right? So um, when I joined Toastmasters a few years ago, I... Um, I mean, it was probably 10 years ago, so it's not a few, but like my first international contest, you know, I was trying to develop this keynote about my football journey. I didn't know how it was going to work, but I had this idea. I'd seen the speaker in Chicago years ago do a lot of call and response, and I thought, well, I have a coach. My, my head coach in, in college used to do a lot of call and response with us as the team. I'm like, can I work that in, right? So that's why, like, my, my keynote's called Hit Hard, Three Must Have Mindsets to Break Through Challenges, and the the, the through line of that speech is I yell hit the audience yells back hard throughout the entire speech. And it's, it's interactive and I use it in different ways and different mechanisms. And I entered this contest just to see if that would be a thing, like just to see if it would work. And it did. Uh, and I, I would get not just like, Hey, this works in a speech when people would come up to me and say, man, that was really impactful. That was really powerful. That was amazing. So, um, I thought this was really cool. And so now I knew I had something that worked. And then so I developed my whole keynote around it. And I had this sort of vision that I'm going to do this one day again at, at the internet. At the time in my mind, it was like at the, somewhere at the international convention, people will be yelling this at me. I will get there. And then a couple of years ago, it was not for the contest. It was for my accredited speaker. I ended up doing the 18 minute version of Hit Hard, which you can find online on both my site and Toastmaster's site. Um, and that was the 18 minute version of that speech, which I incubated in, in Toastmasters was what I gave as my accredited speaker final speech, which was the speech that I was giving to corporations and groups for years, right? But just to sort of see that full circle, I think that was probably one of the coolest moments I've had as a speaker. You know, the other cool moments, you know, I've had are just, it's the little things. It's its not so much the applause and what you get at, you know, when you're on stage. For me, the, the moment's been like, you'll get a random email weeks later about something, uh, you know, like, hey, you know, I saw your talk and it got me to think and I'm going to try this new, I'm going to take the leap forward in my life. And I want to thank you for that. I mean, those, those are the, the, the cool moments um, that you can have. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, doing, you know, doing the big companies and stuff is fun, but I mean, those, it's those one-to-one -one connection. When, when a student, I, I tell you the last one, a, I was at a, a showcase that I, I tanked, right? So I paid these people for me to go on stage and speak for 10 minutes so that they could maybe meeting planners could hire me. And it was, was like years ago. And it, it, 
it was great. It went great on stage, but like nobody bought me. So I'm sitting there licking my wounds and this is terrible. And all of a sudden someone as I'm packing up comes up to me and says, man, I saw your talk yesterday and I really enjoyed it. I'm like, oh, thank you. You know, that's very nice of you. In my head, I'm going, maybe I'm in the wrong business. Maybe I need to quit. And, you know, because, you know, I spent a lot of money and got nothing out of it. I think this is maybe it wasn't that good. And he says, like, you don't understand, like I've struggled with depression. I've struggled with with just, you know, my challenges. And I was really having struggling at this, at this event to even just get out of bed. But I saw your talk and you talked about just pushing forward and finding the positive. And that's what got me out of bed today. And I'm remembering that. And that's, you know, no, no crowd can equal the power of that statement and that thank you. So those are like the cool moments I really like as a speaker. Oh man, those are some pretty cool moments. Now, the next question I have for you is involves somewhat of myself. Let's say that you meet someone that is mm -hmm. interested in what you're doing. They're inspired and they're motivated mm -hmm. about having their own professional speaking career. What solid advice would you give that person who is inspired by what you're doing, that wants to do what you're doing? And they wanna be a speaker? Yes. Um, I would tell them two things. Number one, speak as often as you can, wherever you can. And there is an op wherever there's an opportunity, find it, take it, especially in the early. Get, get the reps under your belts, work it out. Don't worry about the perfect speech. Um, some of your speeches are going to suck. You're going to get, you know, you're, you're going to stink it up. I stink it up now and then too. That's okay. Embrace that, that process. And I think the second thing I would tell them is that you do have to look at it as a business. And so, I know that some people like, you know, they're in speech clubs or Toastmasters or whatever, like, oh, I really love to speak and it's a great hobby. Like when you turn it into a business, it changes the dynamic. It's like anything else you turn into a business. You know, if you, if you, if you like to, uh, you know, if you like to make arts and crafts and now you're selling them on Etsy, like hardcore, like it's going to change your relationship with that activity. So understand that it will change your relationship. And also that like, it is a business. So you want to speak to inspire people. That's fine. I, I, and I struggled with this a long time. And who do I inspire? Well, I can't inspire the world per se. So for me, it's like, what are, who are the perfect people to hear like my message, my, my football message specifically? And for me, I found that was, um, associations and I started with education associations but associations because they have conferences and they need that sort of motivational keynote to start right so um, but I had to treat that as a business versus like hey I have a cool story somebody hire me right so think of it as a business and, and by that I also mean like take a percentage of whatever you make and that's your you're paying yourself it doesn't matter you get paid a, a $50 gift card um, even if five dollars out of that 50 goes into your pocket pay yourself and make it a set amount. Not like, oh, it's going to be 5% this time or 10%. Like set it because it is a business. So some parts need to go to expenses and some parts need to go to you. You need to pay yourself. Otherwise it's just going to become a really expensive hobby. Yes, indeed. Definitely pay yourself first. And that is mm -hmm. truly fundamental and truly vital. Now, the next question I have for you is where can people go to know more information about you? Sure. Well, they can look at the show notes, of course, but if they want to learn more about me, they can, uh, you know, follow me on, on the socials. I'm on LinkedIn under Paul Artali, spell my name, P-A-U-L, and then my last name, Artali, A-R-T-A-L-E. So if you're on Instagram, it's Paul underscore Artali. If you're on LinkedIn, you just got to go find me, find, you know, the guy that says motivational speaker, not the chiropractor in New Jersey, and because uh, he exists and he's a nice guy. I'm trying to reach out to him. Paul, if you're out there, we're probably related. Not a lot of Artalis in the world. Um, let's talk. Um, so LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter's at Paul Artale. And, um, of course you can find me on YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, it's the Paul Artale YouTube channel. And then of course, if you want to learn more about me specifically, um, paulartale.com. And if you go to paulartale.com forward slash speak, there'll be a little intake form. And if you're interested in learning more about becoming a speaker or working on sort of a one-on-one -on -one focus session with me, um, you know, you can set up a sort of a free sort of 20 minute chat about your speaking goals and how I can maybe help you go to that website as well. I love talking to emerging speakers and seeing how I can help them in their journey. I tell you what, for all the happy people that are out there, do not fret because I'm going to put the links in the description below about Paul Artali that he just mentioned. So anytime you want to look at information or want to connect to Paul Artali, please go to the links in the description below. Now, this is, we're almost at the end of this interview and this is a point where we are at the shout out portion of the Sunday morning chat series. Is there anyone out there that you would like to give a shout out to? Uh, shout out to, I mean, I got, I got to give shout outs to my, uh, 
to my lovely wife, Sherry, and my, my son, Alessio and, and Sophia, because my wife has supported me in the speaking journey since day one. And was, like I said, the one that pushed me and called me out on it. Uh, my kids, not just because they're my kids and I love them, but because they're actually the source of some really good material on stage. So um, major shout outs to them. Shout outs to, to the Toastmaster Nation for supporting me and for just being a really good community. Um, at, you know, as I've gone from a guy that was just trying to make it to a guy that's kind of making it now and, and giving me opportunities, you know, I can think of like my folks at district 13 that gave me my first keynote conference opportunity. Um, and I can just go down the list. So shout out to the Toastmasters and shout out to, um, Eric Thomas, um, uh, who I know cause he sat next to me in, uh, in, in our, in our PhD statistics class. Uh, but, uh, Early in my ski speaking career, I was trying to figure it out, and he was getting, you know, he was blowing up. He was becoming Eric. Um, you know, he, he took me aside to give me some great advice, took me on a couple watch-alongs with some of his gigs. And so um, I think that's a lesson for everybody else is that when you're in a position to give back, just give back. And that barely knew me and just sort of has given me great advice over, over the course of my career. And so those are the folks I want to shout out to. You've given us some great people to give shout-outs to. Now, the question I have for you, there are going to be lots of happy people that are going to watch this video. Mm -hmm. They are already amazed. They're already inspired. They're already mm -hmm. saying, wow, to this mm -hmm. wonderful episode. Mm -hmm. If you had a chance to give them wise words of wisdom, what would it be? Well, they're already happy. So <laughs> congrats. Uh, I, I would say, I think it's, I don't want to be cliche, but I think it's, here's the wisdom I would give them. Don't be afraid to let go of who you are so that you can become who you want to be. So even though you're happy now, sometimes to get to the next level, to change who we are in our lives, we need to let go of who we are. It could be a professional identity. It could be a personal identity. It could be your location. So don't be afraid to let go of who you are to become what you want to be is what I would tell them. Wow. And what a way to wrap up this interview. On behalf of all the happy people that are watching this video from all over the world, I'd like to thank you for taking the time out to do this Sunday morning chat series interview. Thanks, Jesse. It was an honor. All right. Now, before, now this concludes the end of the Sunday morning chat series. And if you want more plethora of positivity, go to my YouTube page, type in, just go to YouTube, type in Jesse Oakley III, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell, like this video, and share this other video with happy people that you know. And if you want more information on Paul or Tali, remember the links will be in the description below and stay tuned for future Oak Zone Sunday morning chat series episodes where I get the chance to interview positive, happy people like Paul. Until then, you take care and have a great day, happy people. Bye. Later, everyone.